So this evening there was a, a, another request for a talk, uh, and this time it was a request to talk on jealousy and the Buddhist attitude and solution to jealousy in our life. But uh, also this does tend to connect with the talk I gave last week on uh, conceit and spiritual pride. Because conceit or pride is just, you know, we think we're better than somebody else. And in jealousy, we think someone else is having a much better time than we are. Or they've got a job or a body or a position in life which is so much better than we have. And we feel that we've missed out, that somehow we've been given a raw deal, that these people are having such a wonderful time. Instead of you having to work in your office, the boss is off in Bali somewhere, enjoying themselves on a company retreat while you have to do all this work. Oh, it really sucks. Sometimes that's how I feel. I'm a boss and I have to work so hard. We just had a retreat, the three months range retreat, where I wasn't here, no other monks were here. And some people call it a rest period. It is a rest period for me because I have to do all the work while the rest have an easy time. That's what I call a rest period. <laughs> because you have to teach everybody and you know, look after the place. But this is called like jealousy. And you find that when you start to get any type of jealousy, it doesn't matter where you are and what position in life or what you're doing. It is always easy to see the other person as having a much better time than you have, when it is totally wrong. When I first became a monk, I saw a little video of me when I was in Sydney a couple of days ago. I only just came back from Sydney this morning. I left Sydney at 4 a.m. I had to get up at midnight, flying all through the day. Oh... It's really okay for you guys, you can sleep. Me, I don't have any sleep. It's unfair, I'm so jealous of you. <laughs> but no, what happens is I remember as when I was a really young monk 40 years ago, you know, I was actually very thin. <laughs> really. And the only reason, I'm not sure I said this last week, the only reason that you know you get fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter as a monk, it's not what you eat. It's not just how much you eat. When you become a monk, a spiritual leader, your heart gets bigger and bigger and wider, and it pushes the body out. That's all it is. So it's not fat, it's just this enormous, big, wide heart inside, and it pushes everything out. That's the only reason. That's my excuse. It's a good one, though. You can try that. I've got such a big heart. Anyone who's thin, they must be really mean. They've got such a tiny heart. <laughs> but it was in those days. What we would, this, this so little food we had to eat because this was in the jungles of Thailand. We ate what the villagers ate, which was rice and whatever crawled on the floor. It really was that. Snails, boiled snails. Have you ever seen these erasers, which you know you rub pencils out of? That's what it was like. Snails, boiled snails, like eating a, a eraser. <laughs> you now the boiled frogs. That was one thing we had: just a board of sticky rice and a saucepan of frogs. No salt, no garlic, no sauce at all. Not one vegetable. You could see right down to the bottom of the aluminium pot. It was as if they boiled some water and the frogs just happened to jump in. And they were just big enough for the Chinese spoons. So you just put one on the spoon, had a bit of rice, put it in your mouth and crunched. <laughs> That's actually true, I'm not exaggerating. And that was this, what else we have? We had have water buffalo after birth. <laughs> I'm really grossing you out now. What else can we have? <laughs> we had, you know, ants were very common. Uh, grasshoppers. Actually, grasshoppers were quite nice. That was one of my favourites. <laughs> and you know, I was a vegetarian before I became a monk. So <laughs> I have given anything to have a vegetable or a fruit or something. They didn't have it. Okay, but you'd have the pot 
and it'd be given to the senior monks first of all, you know, the abbots, you know, the big shots, and it'd be passed down the line. Everyone would take what they want, and the last one in the line, which was me, I got what was left over. In other words, all the abbots, they got the best frogs, and I got the one which was left over. You know, I was very jealous. Because I thought that these senior monks had been monks for years. Number one, they must all be enlightened by now. I wasn't enlightened. Those monks would have no craving. Whatever they ate would be okay because they'd been enlightened. They didn't have any desires. Me, I had lots of desires. You'd expect when you start out. So really, I should have got the best food because I would really appreciate it. They, it was wasted on our hearts, enlightened beings. And anyway, they were so fat and I was so thin. But not only that, you see, the, if you go to Buddhist monasteries, the senior monks, they get the biggest cushions. And the, the young monks, they just have to sit on the floor. And I thought that was very unfair too. Because the senior monks, they didn't need cushions. They had their own built-in upholstery. <laughs> they were fat on the bottom. But they got all the big cushions. And when it came to work, all the senior monks, they decided what we were going to do. Because, you know, monks have to work. It's not an easy life. You know, we have to sort of go and do chores, build things, you know, uh, have wheelbarrows full of earth and push them up hills and down hills. So it's really hard work. Senior monks, the fat ones, they did no work at all. They just told us what to do. That was really unfair. You know, I got very jealous. I thought, wouldn't it be nice if one day I became a senior monk? Then I would you know, have a nice cushion to sit on. I'd have the first choice of the food. And I wouldn't have to work so hard. And I was so jealous. Now I am a senior monk. I have to work so hard talking to people, counseling them. They come up with their marriage problems, with their financial problems, with their health. I'm not a doctor. I said, oh, I'm hurting. Can you give me some chanting, some holy water? Can you... Rah, rah, rah? <laughs> it's true. I said, no. You know, even these days, they say, can we take your photograph? Why are you taking photographs for? I'm a fat old monk. I'm not Justin Bieber or some... <laughs> hot Beyonce apparently was here last week. And I can sort of imagine Beyonce having a photograph taken, but a Buddhist monk? You know, you're crazy. So now, now I'm jealous of the junior monks. <laughs> they don't have to do anything, put a few wheelbarrows, I've got no problems, you don't have to think about answering all these difficult questions, you don't have to give talks, you don't have to travel all over the world doing this and doing that. Oh, I'm so jealous of the junior monks. Now, if you, <laughs> if you wanted to, you could get into that jealousy. Have you ever been in that position? You always think that your boss is having a much easier life than you are, or your husband is having it easier, or you have to do all the work in the, at the home, or you know, the kids you know, think that once I grow up and you know, become independent, then I'll be happy. You always found that, that we're always jealous of other people until we become that other person, and then we're jealous of where we came from. Always the old story, the grass on the other side of the fence. It reminds me of a story I read years ago about the farmer who had mouldy hay. I've seen it now. If ever you go to one of our monasteries down in Serpentine or the Nuns Monastery to Giti Gadam, you'll find all the farmers are mowing their fields now and creating these hay bales. And all the hay from last year they're trying to get rid of because it may be mouldy now. And you know also that farmers don't like spending any money at all. They're really stingy. So when this farmer had lots of mouldy hay, even though he had lots of new hay, he wanted to get rid of it. So he put it in the field for his cows to eat. And the cows, they wouldn't touch the mouldy hay. No more than you would touch you know, any mouldy lettuce or mouldy potato. And the cows were the same. They just would rather be hungry than eat this stuff. So the farmer couldn't get rid of it. So the next idea he had was to mix it up with good hay. You know, mix it all up. Like, you know, sometimes to get your kids to eat what they you know, don't like 
mix it up with what they do like and maybe that works. Cows are not stupid. They've got noses. They push the bad hay away and they eat the good stuff. So still he was left with all this mouldy hay. But this farmer was really smart. If ever you go to a field where there are cows, where there's a fence around, you'll always see the cows pushing their heads through the fence and eating the grass just on the opposite side. So, what this guy did, he put the mouldy hay outside of the paddock, not in it, but not too far away from the fence. There was a bit of a stretch, a cow could push their head through the fence and get that mouldy hay. It was all gone in a day. <laughs> cow psychology is no different than human psychology. <laughs> it's just how we were. I told this story just in, I was in Sydney because they're having their AGM trying to choose a president for their Buddhist uh, group over in Sydney. And I said some years ago we were trying to get you know, the president of our Buddhist society and there was one person which I thought would make a very good pres president. She's not here this evening. It's Rachel you know, in Armadale Group. And uh, she admits this is totally true. Now I approached her and said, how about being the president of our committee of our Buddhist Society of West Australia next year? And she, you know, she was running her own business. And she said, look, I'm really busy. You now my business is growing. I've got to give all my attention to the business. I just can't find the time. So she said, no. It's very easy to get your own way as a Buddhist monk because I know psychology. I teach psychologists. You know, I know more than they do. So even though this was a good business lady, <laughs> and she was supposed to be smart, but, well, she is very smart. I better say this because this is being recorded. I've got to be very careful what I say <laughs> when these talks are recorded. So I said, look, no, I'm, I'm really compassionate. I said, look, I know you. You'll probably go home and worry and feel guilty about this now that you've refused this offer of mine. Because I've helped you before and now I've asked you to help me and you can't do it. So to make sure you don't feel guilty about refusing this offer, I'm telling you here right now, I ban you from being president next year. Don't even think about it because if you do, I won't allow it. I'll ban you. I'll use everything in my power to stop you. She went home and she thought, what do you mean banning me? He can't ban me. Who, do you th who does he think he is? He can't stop me. I can do whatever I want. So she nominated for being president. <laughs> and she was president for two years. <laughs> and she admitted, I got her, I chicked her. And it's just because it was forbidden. That's why it becomes very attractive. The grass on the other side of the fence always looks more attractive. You're jealous of it simply because it's out of reach. It's bad, it's forbidden. That is why it's attractive. So with the, <laughs> the jealousy business, and sometimes it's because it's something we don't know, haven't appreciated. It has its own attractiveness to it. So what to do is be a bit more smart, you know, just find out what's on the other side of the fence. And when you do, you find, why did I ever want that mouldy old hay? The grass in my own paddock was always much more delicious. I know some people are jealous of the rich and the famous and the beautiful. But even a long time ago, you know, I heard lots of stories about people who were rich, who were beautiful. There's this one monk which I grew up with, and you know, he was from New Mexico, but he moved and went to university in Los Angeles. And this was, you know, must have been four, 50 years ago now. And so he started meeting all these great stars. You know, he said, because he was in the university, in the United States, you know, they, the students in the university, they join these fraternity houses, you know, where they can just socialize with just a small group of people. And he was in his fraternity house last night, and uh, you know, who would um, come in but Clint Eastwood. You now, he was only just a, a, a budding actor. 
because he'd gone to the same for, uh, university, the same fraternity, he said, guys, any of you got tuxedos? I'm having a party tonight. And we need some bouncers. You know, these were students. So, you know, this guy had a tux, so he went to this Hollywood party. And I remember him telling me that there was this film actress who drove up in her fur mobile. It was totally upholstered in fur. That's what they used to do in Hollywood. And he had the opportunity of driving it to the parking lot to park the fur mobile. <laughs> so you know, he had an idea. And he also managed, he said, to one day you know, get into the hotel to pass the security where you know, Bob Dylan was staying overnight and hang out with Bob Dylan just all night. And I always remember him telling me that you know, he was talking to Bob Dylan, who was by the way always very famous, he was saying, it must be great being Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan replied, it's just a pain in the new, you know where, being Bob Dylan. And if you ever know anyone who's famous, if you ever speak to them, you just know how much pain it is, how much difficulty, how much lack of freedom there is being famous. So please never ever be jealous of fame. It's a burden. I am getting well known. I'm not as famous as Bob Dylan, even though many people sometimes go to my gigs overseas. Even, uh, I think I was, I told you, I think, last year, when I gave a talk in, in Medan, is I caused a traffic jam, two kilometers around, about 3.8, 3 no, 3,800 came. I got banned from the Taiping Center in Singapore because so many people came in, they broke all their fire regulations. But my greatest claim to fame was when I gave a talk in Jakarta. The tickets, they had to sell tickets, not only for like, 10 cents each or something, just so they could control the crowds. And so that uh, my ticket sold out in two hours. About 5,000 people, I think it was. At the same time, Lady Gaga was giving a talk. <laughs> Not a talk, I think singing. Apparently it was banned in the end, but her tickets took eight hours to sell. <laughs> Mine only two hours. And so they told everybody when they introduced me, here is Ajahn Brahm much more famous than Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly more well behaved. But it's really horrible if people know you. Because sometimes you can't do anything. I was talking to Dennis over there that I remember going to Hong Kong giving talks and people wanted to make photos of me and ask me questions. And after the talk, it's the same here you guys. I say, any questions? And everyone is quiet. So we bow. And then after we finish, a whole line of people <laughs> asking questions. <laughs> so here they were asking questions afterwards, asking and asking and asking. And I'm a monk. I'm a man. I ha I've got a bladder and it sometimes gets full. So that's the trouble being famous, you're not allowed to go to the toilet. <laughs> so finally, after about an hour and a half of agony, I managed to get to the toilet in the foyer of this auditorium, the jockey club in one of the universities there. And as soon as I got into the toilet, you know what happened? This guy he just finished washing his hands. He turned around, oh, you're Ajahn Brahm. Can I ask you a question on meditation? <laughs> he wouldn't even let me go in the toilet. I got in the room, but that's as far as I could get. <laughs> so don't ever be jealous of fame. Sometimes it's not just fame we're jealous of, sometimes we're jealous of being wealthy. Some monks, some monks have got enough power in their meditation to know the lottery numbers coming up next week. Would you like to know? If you say yes, you're stupid. <laughs> what do you want to be rich for? Sometimes we're so jealous. Oh, if only I could be rich and build a big house and have a nice car and have nothing to worry about. No bills, no worries about paying off debts. 
oh, life will be wonderful. Idiot. <laughs> it's not wonderful. I've known very wealthy people, incredibly wealthy people. It's, they are so screwed up, most of them. This, I love telling this story. In one lady, I think she had a house on the river somewhere, and she asked me to go and bless it. So I went there, you know, from Serpentine Monastery. So I forget where it was, Apple Cross or somewhere, I forget where. And anyway, it's a huge mansion. And when I went to sit down, again, it's another toilet story. I said, I need to go to the toilet. Which way? Now, in your house, you just stay just over there. Her, now this is no exaggeration. I should have kept this piece of paper. She had to draw me a map of how to get to her toilet in her big mansion. This was quite a few years ago, because these days people who buy big houses, they always come with GPS. <laughs> so you can, <laughs> you can navigate your way around the mansion. <laughs> and it was left here, right there, up the stairs, down here, to get just to the loo. It's a huge mansion. And that was when I asked her, this question, just asking, just making polite conversation. How many people live in your house? She said, just me. Oh, and that was so sad. You know, that took away just your breath. In this huge house, all by herself. I said, why? Because she's so afraid of her family asking her for some of her money. <laughs> And visitors, she doesn't like visitors coming in, because they too are asking for a loan, or some money for their business, or for the whatever it is. That's what happens when you're that wealthy. You're afraid that other people want your money. Which is why many wealthy people are so alone. Even you meet somebody, and you want to start a relationship, do they really love me, or do they love my bank account? And you never know. It just really complicates things. Which is why, don't be jealous of people being rich. The best way, this is basic Buddhism, and it's just a beautiful saying of the Buddha, the middle way. The middle way is the best way in everything. You know, not wealthy, not poor. You are the happiest. If you don't believe me, there are many, many studies have been done. You can get them on the internet. Some years ago, they did this uh, research in the United States, they did it in England, and they did it in Australia as well. They got the same results. The optimum income for being happy. Because if you get too much income, you really are too many worries. How are you going to invest it? Where are you going to invest it? Always looking at the stock market going up, going down. It causes you heart attacks. Do you have heart attacks about the stock market? No, because I don't have any shares. I can't afford anything. You are free of so much suffering. <laughs> but some of you, you know, you haven't got enough money to pay the bills even. You're in financial difficulty. That's suffering too. So there must be like an optimum. Too little money, too many problems. Too much money, too many problems. So what is the optimum amount of money which makes you the happiest? And psychologists very easily worked it out. A few years ago, it was like 50,000 Australian, you know, per person. That was the optimum. 100,000, your happiness actually went down. Maybe now these days, maybe because of inflation, 60 or 70,000 or whatever. But you know, there is a number. Certainly 100,000, 150,000, you've got too many worries and suffering. So, if anybody is in that salary bracket, I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> Out of compassion for you, I can make you happier. <laughs> Come and see me afterwards. <laughs> but don't be jealous of the other people. Sometimes we're jealous of the people who've got the great jobs. Are you jealous of the person in your company, in your office, who's doing better than you, so you think? 
Are you jealous enough to really want that promotion so your career can improve and get better, so you can start joining the high flyers? If you are, again, you are dumb. Why is that? So you get your promotion. You get a little bit more money as you go up the career ladder. But no matter how money you have, is it ever enough? So really, the salary level you're on now is not enough. When you get the promotion, it's still not enough. But the only difference is now you have more stress. Why do you want more stress for? It doesn't make any sense to me. People want to have this big sort of promotion to become the manager, to become the boss, and all they ever get is more problems to fix. To me, the wise people are the ones who are in the middle of the company. The ones who evade all of the attention from their superiors. The one who float about. Did you ever read the Dilbert cartoon? There was that guy, the engineer, what was his name? Who never did anything, but never had any, <laughs> never had any responsibility. Always was, had a cup of coffee in his hand. Wally, that's right, yeah. That's it. He, was, he was the smartest guy I've ever seen in the comics. You know, he managed, he managed to give, he never got any promotions, but he had a very stress-free life. So what do you want in life? Sometimes we, again, this is what jealousy is. We think that if we can get the promotion, if we can marry that beautiful person, if we can get the increase in our f fame or whatever, that then we'll be happy. That's what jealousy is. And what wisdom is, is realizing it doesn't really matter it's not what you have, but your attitude towards it which makes you happy. So never think that promotion, money, fame, or any of these other, what the Buddha called worldly dhammas, will increase your happiness. It never does. It usually gives you more problems. The only way to increase your happiness is to learn how to be grateful and value what you already have to value the grass which you already have inside your paddock, rather than always thinking the next paddock must be more delicious. Now one of the reasons why we get into this stupid jealousy business is because from a very early age, this is the cause of jealousy, is that we are encouraging competition Whenever there's competitiveness, there'll always be jealousy of those who win against those who lose. And that's one of the problems with our modern world. The competition is encouraged, it is promoted, it's on the TV game shows, it's in the sport, it's in the office, and sometimes you may even see it in religious organizations. That's why I told last week, please, no competition. No spiritual pride, no competition. Who's got the best religion? Who's got the best teacher? Who's got the best meditation? Na 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 na. I can meditate longer than you can. Na 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 na. That is so juvenile, but it happens. So instead of that, we don't compete with each other. And when we don't compete with each other, you find that not only is there no jealousy, but there's less anger, resentment, there's less politics. Thinking outside the box some years ago, you know, I come up with suggestions which you no know, one day may actually get traction somewhere because many people listen to this, and this is not just no, ordinary people, some, I know there's one senator in the federal government listens to these talks regularly, and I'm sure there's many other people listen to these talks, people in power, people with influence. You know, some of these suggestions may be quite uh, unique and controversial, but you can see they do have some merit behind them. Why is it that we teach and encourage competition in schools so much? So strongly that the best of friends have you finished the 
tertiary entrance examinations yet? The you know for university, they're finished already. They're still going on. They're finished. Okay. But the last couple of weeks, when all the kids in year twelve were doing these exams, you know, for entry to university, you get people with the best of friends competing against each other, hiding their books from one another, hiding their secrets, not helping each other out, because this was the exam which is going to take me to university, and if you do better than me, I'm going to lose my place. And isn't it nasty that we have that competition sometimes between the best of friends? And you know, because we are that competitive, you know, at, in school to get to university, that competitiveness goes right through our life, into our relationships, where husband and wife, or boy and boy, whatever relationship it is, actually compete against each other. Have you known that in your relationship? Instead of learning how to cooperate in a company which should be working together, again, they compete. Many years ago when I first came, there was one of the members, he just migrated from West Germany. This was before unification. At that time, I think the West German economy was the best in the world, beating Japan, China, United States. It was a very, very strong economy. And he told me that when he, when he came and worked here in Western Australia, his work friends sort of said to him, oh, you Germans, you've got such a good economy because you really know how to work hard. He said, no, that's not right. I work much harder in, here in Australia than I ever worked in Germany. And I asked him, well, why was your economy so strong? He said, because when I was working in Germany, this was you know, before unification, he said, we would work cooperatively. Here in Australia, he said, we work like this, competing against each other in the same office, in the same company. He said, that was why we had to work so hard to be competitive, to be productive. So when you work together, you have cooperation instead of competition you get far more success, far more productivity. And also you don't have this jealousy business. So I was suggesting, why not in schools, even in year 12s, to actually to give, say, 70% of your score for university entrance is your personal score in the examination which you have just sat. And the other 30% is made up of the average over all the children in the class to which you belong. So it, you're rewarding, you helping the weaker students in your class. That co cooperation is also rewarded instead of just competition. Because if we reward the skills of cooperation, then we will be um, encouraging, motivating, and uh, growing those skills of how to work together instead of how always to work against one another. And where we have cooperation, you find jealousy diminishes enormously. And that's really important between things like religions in our world, things like um, politics, that is really sucks in Australia. The amount of competition and hardly any cooperation. And we all make feel that's disgusting. This is our country. This is our world. There's so many things we could do if you could learn how to cooperate instead of always having this three yearly competition. Who's going to be in power here? And basically we've lost the skills of cooperation. And that's the opposite of jealousy. And this was encouraged so much by Buddhism that in Buddhism they had this, this emotion which was never encouraged when I was young. I never heard of it before. It's an emotion which is a total opposite of jealousy. And it was called like sympathetic joy. It's called mudita. And mudita is celebrating other people's success, not being jealous of them. Your friend 
gets a promotion. And you yes, well done, tremendous, well done. Because when you celebrate somebody else's success, you also take part in that success. You do get a piece of the action. Somebody else wins the lotto and they get a lot of money. Yes, well done. That makes me so happy that you're rich. You get some of the excitement too. This is actually where we celebrate other people's success and happiness. It's a total opposite of jealousy. And it's a free source of happiness, inspiration and joy, which helps the cooperation, which actually helps lessen this terrible fighting and jealousy, which can cause you so much pain and anxiety and even sickness. So the next time that somebody else wins against you and you come second, isn't it wonderful to celebrate them? Well done, you did a, such a great race. Well done. You'll remember that sort of, I just come to mind, the Paralympics. I never actually saw this, but so many people talked to him about it. In the Paralympic race, when one of the competitors in the final fell over, and everyone stopped to pick them up and help them along across the line, all together. Just what an inspiration that was. Did I describe that correctly? Because I, I didn't see it, because I don't watch the TV. They said this was an Olympic, Paralympic sort of finals of some race. And the last competitors, they trained for years to get to this level. And they were in the final, watched by millions of people throughout the world. And one of the competitors stumbled and fell just a little bit before the line. And instead of all the others carrying on to win, they stopped. They all stopped and picked up this person. And they all crossed the line together. That was inspirational. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And instead of having, I'm winning, and I don't care about anyone else, the beautiful competition and caring about each other, and celebrating sort of the beauty of life, those people who do really well, that is actually part of this beautiful mudita concept, the sympathetic joy. When somebody else succeeds, you celebrate with them. When somebody else you know, is happy, you enjoy their happiness as well. Instead of always being just so jealous. Why them and not me? It's never again about them and me. Life is always and will always be about us. That's the secret of cooperation. So when one person in a family wins, we all win. When somebody makes a great discovery, we all benefit. When somebody goes past their personal best and succeeds and does something amazing, we all celebrate. Each one of us stands on the podium rather than just one. That is cooperation. It is mudita, sympathetic joy. So everybody enjoys. You know that in sport sometimes it's too much competition. I was never competitive. You know, when I was a kid. Maybe that's why I became a Buddhist monk. This is where I belong. The last, I used to like soccer, coming from a place like England. The last soccer match I ever played, this is absolutely true, for the college, you know, which I went to in Cambridge. If those of you know soccer, it's 11 a side. Only nine of their team turned up, and we were 11. So we had two more players than they did. And at half time, after 45 minutes, we were about 6 nil up. It was such a one-sided game. that I went to my captain and said, can I play on the other side for the second half to make a game of it? He swore at me, he said, no, we're here to win. And that just, I wasn't going to play anymore. Because for me, it was like playing for fun. It didn't matter who won. And that really was true. That's why, the, you know, I've said in my, one of my books, I did actually think many years ago of starting a Buddhist football team in Australia. No, a footy team. 
You know, because it would be... The reason I thought like this is because we could have like a game against the Anglicans. You know, and it would, or the, the Catholics, or the Muslims, or the Jews, or whatever. And that would actually, you know, when you play sport together, you may be able to get some just more friendship, and more cooperation between the great religions of our country, or maybe the atheists as well. And I, but then I thought that if you can have a Buddhist football team, it would have to play on Buddhist principles. Which means, we'd always have to be compassionate, and never scoring a goal if it really hurt and upset the others. <laughs> and always letting go. If the other team wanted the ball, here, take it. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be fun to have a competition like that? You have the ball. And they said, no, no, you have it. No, no. You, come on, you have it. No, no, you. I'm not going to kick a goal because that will upset you. <laughs> it'd be a weird game, but at least it'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> That's like cooperation instead of competition. So a lot of jealousy comes whenever we have too much competition in our world. And the jealousy comes when we don't have enough appreciation that we're all in it together. So when one person's successful, we're all successful. You know, there's, I remember as a kid learning about you know, the five fingers on a hand. There's many five finger similes. This fits similar to the five fingers on a hand. If one finger gets sick, gets an infection, then all the fingers get infected. The whole hand can't be used. The fingers of a hand are so connected together. That is why, like in a family, if one person in the family has problems, the whole family has a problem. If one person in our Buddhist society has a problem, I have a problem too. That's why that connection, that we care about each other. When one finger is healthy, it makes all the fingers healthy. So when one person succeeds, when they have a great good fortune, when they sort of have a beautiful, beautiful day, instead of feeling jealous, can't we just say, we're not in competition anymore, we're connected. You're having a wonderful day, I have a wonderful day too. Just thinking just how happy you are. That is the opposite of jealousy. Which is one of the reasons why I, you know, I just come back from Sydney working really hard. I've been working hard all day, you know, since midnight, your time. The last, what time is it now? That's 20 hours, 20 hours and 44 minutes since I woke up this morning. I've been working really hard. You get so much joy. So I don't think, oh, it's unfair. Why me? No, we say, why not? We say, I volunteer. I volunteer to work hard, to work on my butt. Not out of jealousy, but just out of fun, out of loving kindness, out of sympathetic joy. So, whatever grass I have in my paddock, I'm content with it. I'm not jealous of your grass. Whatever grass you have, don't be jealous of mine. Eat your own grass. It's the best you can possibly get. <laughs> And don't go eating others. <laughs> now that's the opposite of jealousy. It makes the world a much happier place. And when we don't have jealousy, we don't have office politics, we don't have backstabbing, we don't have these snide comments you know, to each other in a relationship, in a marriage. We don't have this awful competition which oftentimes tries to pull somebody else down, finding their faults. That's jealousy when we try and find faults with other people to try and pull them down so we're better. No, we celebrate each other's good qualities. We appreciate, we're grateful. Grateful, gratitude, sympathetic joy. That's all the opposite of jealousy. Which is why that if you really are practicing a good spiritual path, like Buddhism, a real Buddhism, jealousy doesn't have any part of it. If one person, you've been coming here for years and years and years, you've been one of these people who are coming to our Buddhist temple for when it first opened of about 30, 40 years ago, over 30 years ago, and you find that somebody has just come in for the first or second time today and they've just become enlightened and you've been coming here 30 years and you haven't even started yet, how would you feel? Would you feel, yes, wonderful, 
What do you feel? That sucks. I've been doing so much. For 30 years I've been coming here. I haven't got anything. And this Jojo comes in. They get enlightened after one or two days. That's terrible. Blah, blah, blah. That is jealousy. If you have that sort of attitude, you haven't understood anything about these teachings. So when somebody has a beautiful meditation, when somebody does a beautiful thing, like an act of generosity, an act of kindness, we all celebrate instead of one person doing it and everyone else throwing away the opportunity for celebration and happiness because they are jealous. Once we understand it, then we can let it go. Once we see its cause, competition rather than cooperation, then we can overcome it. Once we see that it's because we think we're separate from other people, that's why we fight with other people. We're in this together. Once we see we're connected, then there's no more jealousy anymore. A company, that's what a company means. There's a group of people supposedly working together in the same direction, cooperating. Therefore, there's no jealousy in the office. We're cooperating, working together. If one person does really good, we all prosper. If one person does a beautiful thing, the whole world glows and is beautiful. That's cooperation when we realize we're in it together. But when you think you're alone, when you think this world is all about me, of course you'll be jealous. So never ever think that this world is just you. Whether you like it or not, you are not alone. You may be surprised, but many people care about you. They really want you to be happy. And when you're happy, it makes so many other people happy. Celebrate your happiness. That's sympathetic joy. Therefore, when you realize you're not alone, your whole mindset changes. Jealousy doesn't come in anymore. Cooperation and this beautiful joy that we all win. The sympathetic joy which stops jealousy. Thank you for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Very good. Okay, so now we got the questions from overseas. And don't be jealous that overseas people have the opportunity to ask questions and you don't. There was one guy here and he was so upset he could never ask a question because the overseas questions were asked first. On his smartphone, he actually asked a question pretending he was from Indonesia. He was actually sitting over there. <laughs> yes, a question from there, first of all. Yes. Yes. Oh, he got the mic, yeah. I was just wondering if you could tell us, if somebody is jealous of, of you, how best do you deal with that? If somebody is jealous of you, explain what it's like to be you. And you say, I wouldn't be me for the world, so I don't know why you want to be me. <laughs> if someone is jealous of Ajahn Brahm, oh, just come, come and spend 24 hours with me. Or just sit next to me and just all the hard work. And this actually what happened once when I gave an answer to a question in Singapore in a big talk there. And somebody, the question they asked is, that's easy for you to say all of that because you're a monk, you don't have to work hard like we do. And then I actually went through what I'd done that day from about 4 o'clock in the morning until this was about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night without any rest. And after I gave my answer, this guy got back on the microphone. I'll never forget this. He said, I work in IT in Singapore. Now, I always wanted to become a monk to lessen my stress, but not anymore. <laughs> when he saw what I did, <laughs> I lost a the monk there. But, so, so you're not jealous when you find out what a monk is. A monk is another monk's life. Yours is your life. You're not being jealous of anything. If they really realize what it's like to be you, they would not be jealous anymore. So, you know, they have to go to the other side of the fence. And they realize the grass isn't greener. Their grass is good enough. If you can actually do that, it's a difficult thing to do, but explain, you know, the problems you have, the difficulties. The jealousy only sees half the story, what they think it might be like to be Bob Dylan, what they think it might be like if they were rich. They see all the positives, they don't see all the problems. So tell them all the problems you face being you. 
Does that make any sense? That women always want to be really beautiful. And they're jealous of these really hot girls. You ask, you know, so, as a monk it's really good because sometimes you meet these hot girls and, you know, because you're a monk you're always cool. You know, they can't do anything with you. <laughs> so they relax and just tell you what it feels like. There's, I've met so many of these people who are just very beautiful and they just don't like it. They'd rather be average. So every time, you know, they try and start a relationship, all the boy ever sees is their, their beauty, their figure. They never see actually who they are. So they, you know, the relationship is never deep. They're just some sort of beautiful hot object rather than a being. So that's one of the problems. And the other thing, I can't resist saying this one again. Any young guy here, never, ever, ever marry a beautiful girl. Don't do that. If you marry a beautiful girl, you'll be jealous for the rest of your life. Because other guys will look at her. She's beautiful. That's what guys do. They just look at the beautiful girls. And they'll be looking at her and you think, what are they looking at my wife for? You have a very lot of doubts all your life. But if you marry an ugly girl, you'll have nothing ever to worry about. No other boy will want her. She's yours forever. You can go overseas, you know, on a business trip. You don't have to worry about her. So, married ugly girl is the best advice for any people who's not married. And all you girls never ever marry a rich guy. I know it's amazing. Sometimes girls they they really get attracted to you know people with a fat wallet. If you marry a rich guy with a really good job and a lot of income, big house, nice car, again, later on in life, if not now, he'll be able to afford a mistress. He can have an affair when he's rich. If you marry a poor guy, he just can't pay for it. He can't afford it. <laughs> so again, you've got nothing to worry about. You have this beautiful, happy marriage. So this is my advice <laughs> to young people. Guys marry ugly girls. Girls marry poor guys. And you'll be happy ever after. It's my <laughs> <laughs> so all you girls, if you're not married yet, you're looking for a nice relationship, never go to beauty parlor, go to ugly parlor. <laughs> and make yourself a much better candidate for marriage. So don't try and just be jealous of the people who are really hot and just got nice figures and good hair or whatever. That's, that's not the way to get a good relationship. So don't be jealous. Okay. Anyway, I should actually answer some questions from overseas before the overseas people get upset at me again. This is from Seattle. That's Jimi Hendrix's place. You know, I used to really like Jimi Hendrix. And I, I was, he was my big idol when I was young. And my hair, it wasn't like this. I had Jimi Hendrix haircut. And I went to Seattle once to give some talks. And I had a free afternoon. And people in Seattle said, why didn't you go to Jimi Hendrix Museum? You know, because it's Jimi Hendrix Museum, it's in Seattle. And I thought, I'm a monk, I shouldn't really go to such things. The monks are supposed to give up all of those things. So I went. <laughs> and this is my karma. I went there, and that afternoon, one afternoon a week, it was shut. <laughs> it just really taught me a lesson. <laughs> anyway, um, how do we keep this cooperation attitude while the majority of the people in our workplace are they so much into competition with each other, but also encouraged to do so? This is old-fashioned business, last century. Cooperation, working together, is modern business practice. Last June, yeah, June, July, I co-presented with Chade Meng. He wrote a best-selling book. Um, search inside yourself because you know he was the eight, no, I think worker number eighty seven in Google, so he was you know in Google when it was a startup company, and so you know he's one of the big shots in Google, you know and that is a very successful company, and he was telling me that they don't do competition, they do cooperation. That's one of the important parts of their company ethos: teamwork, working together cooperating because you can say if you compete against each other you actually destroy imagine like in a football team and people competing on the same side for the ball 
should be tackling the other side, not tackling your own person on your own side. And that's what we do in business. And imagine like the West Coast Eagles playing the Fremantle Dockers. That's our two local teams. Instead of actually tack, you know, an Eagles player tackling the, tackling the Dockers player, the Eagles player goes and tackles another Eagles player. Would that be dumb? That would be very dumb. And that's what people do in business. At least on the same side and the same company you should be working together. So if that happens in people's companies, that company is going to go down. They're not going to be able to compete. You know, with other companies, if they're fighting within themselves. Apparently, I was reading the newspapers, that was one of the reasons they said why the AOP did very badly in the election. Too much infighting, too much internal competition, instead of cooperating with one another and working as a team, presenting policies as a team, killed the Labour Party in Australia in the last election. So, if you do that in a company, you're going to be in big trouble. So, I think, whatever that company is, that's last century business practice. Cooperation has to be the way forward. Teamwork, working together. Now, that's from Seattle. This one is from Vietnam. I have jealousy when I perceive someone is trying to take someone away from me. I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. What can I do to not be so jealous of these people? One thing you can do, if someone tries to take someone away from you and they succeed, then that person wasn't really worth being your friend or your partner anyway. If they don't appreciate you, then they must be really dumb from Vietnam. <laughs> so a lot of times, if someone tries to take a person away and they, and they give in and are taken away, that person is very weak and very um, unreliable. A good person, I mean, loyalty is a beautiful quality in human beings. And it's something which I always try and remember. You know, I've, many times I've had invitations, because I'm a well-known man, why are you living in Perth? We'll build you a nice monastery in Sri Lanka. They offer me this beautiful monastery in Sri Lanka. So you just, these rich people, you just tell me what you want, and we'll build it for you. You know, these mi millionaires. And I also, the Sri Lankan Vihara in London, I received a letter because their abbot died. They said, do you like to take over and be the abbot of the London Buddhist Vihara? And sometimes I go to Sydney. They say, what are you in Perth for? Sydney's more people in Sydney. You know, it's the, the biggest populated state. Why don't you come over there? You'll be able to do so much more over there. I've had all these offers. Singapore. They'd love me to go over there and live over there. But I am loyal to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that loyalty is really important to me because that's part of being virtuous. You know, you've cared for me, I care for you, that loyalty. Sometimes when you do things together for such a long time, you know each other, you work together, you just can't say, bye bye, thank you very much, I'm out of here. This gratitude, this beautiful quality which sticks people together. And what we've been through together, the fun, the arguments, everything together, that gives that sense of beautiful loyalty. And I think it's wonderful when people have loyalty, whether it's in sport, when they get this big offer to come and join another sports team, they say, no, you know, this is my club, I love the club, I've been here all my life, I'm staying. This is my, you know, the, the company I started working for when I was a kid. Yeah, I could get a better offer somewhere else, but no, this, I'm loyal. Isn't that loyalty something beautiful? They have gratitude. So, if that person has been taken away from you, they lack that beautiful loyalty. So, it means a person you know, wasn't really, really a good person anyway. So it's not your fault. It's not the, the person who was trying to take that, that person away from you. Both the people are not really worth it. Find some better friends, some loyal friends. We're always going to stick by you. And don't worry about borderline personality disorder. Everyone's got some personality disorder. I've got a big personality disorder. You now I tell bad jokes. The latest joke, which... Oh, okay, I, I already started now. Please excuse me if this is gross. If your children are here, please put their hands over their ears. I told this in Sydney a couple of days ago. A uh, policeman in New South Wales 
saw a car speeding. So pulled it, the car over. It was a woman driver. And so as soon as the woman driver opened up her window, she said to the policeman, I suppose you stopped me to actually to uh, get me to buy a ticket for the policeman's ball. And the policeman replied, policemen don't have balls. <laughs> and then realized what he was saying and said, have a good afternoon, madam. <laughs> was that too much over the top? <laughs> I don't know, anyway. You see, that, that is my personality problem. <laughs> my bad joke disorder. <laughs> well, I can't help myself. It's, you know, it's an obsession. <laughs> So don't worry about yourself and don't demean yourself. Don't ever think you're a lesser person than others because you know, you've got some disorder, some problem with you. I said this last week and the week before and probably the week before that. The trees in the forest, there's no such thing as a perfect tree in any forest except government plantations. And no one, do you ever like to go on a picnic in a government plantation? Of course not. You're like going to the real forest where every tree is damaged. They've got borderline bark disorder. They've got obsessive leaning this way or that way disorders. There's no such thing as a perfect tree. They're all damaged. Which is why they're beautiful. Madam from Vietnam, you're damaged. You're not perfect. You've got borderline personality disorder. That is why you're a beautiful person and you belong in this wonderful forest of humanity where no one is perfect. That's why you're lovable. Anyway, last one from Sri Lanka. Sometimes my mind keeps wandering non-stop in meditation. I have tried the mantra, Om Mani Padmi Hum, but it didn't work. What should I do to silence my mind? Okay, stop trying to silence your mind. Just let it be. Stop fighting it. Because when you're fighting and trying to stop it, that is what is making it move. Are you enjoying the talk today? It's gone past time, it's four minutes past nine. Why are you still here? Because you're having fun. Having fun and joy is a secret to a still mind. The mind only wanders because it's not happy. It wants to be somewhere else. So tell your mind, I want to be here. I enjoy being here. With my dumb, stupid, wandering mind, I'm happy. Mind, wander as much as you like. Then you're enjoying yourself. Then you'll be here. Then the mind will not wander. What's it wandering away from? It's wandering away from you. It's trying to escape from you. Because you've got a bad relationship with your mind. Always telling it what to do. Stop thinking. Stop thinking all these stupid fantasies. Stop getting angry. You're a monk. Stop, stop, stop. You're a control freak. Which is why when your mind sees you coming, it will run away as soon as possible and hide. It's afraid of you. That is why it wanders off. So the secret of having a mind which is still is having a good relationship with your mind. Being a friend to your mind and loving your mind for what it is the beautiful tree leaning all over the place all scarred and damaged when you love your mind your mind sees you coming meditation time and my mind sees me coming hey it's you again yeah it's me we hang out together with no effort and the mind never tries to escape why? because me and my mind are the best of friends that is how to stop the wandering mind. So, there we go. That's uh, all your questions in life answered. But I'm sure you'll have some more next week, I hope. Otherwise I'll be out of a job. But I won't be jealous if I am. So thank you for listening. <laughs> We're now to the bowing. For those of you who don't know about bowing, somebody asked me before. The first time I bow to a Buddha statue, I bow to virtue, because I worship virtue, goodness. The second time I bow, I bow to peace, because peace in my own heart, peace in my monastery, peace in the Buddhist society, peace in the world is so important to me, so I worship it. I bow my head down to peace. And lastly, I bow my head down to compassion. 
Compassion is just what adds so much joy and happiness and inspiration to my world and your world. So I always bow to virtue, peace and compassion. I was told by neuroscientists, or actually a psychologist who read some neuroscience, every time you bow your head, apparently nitrous oxide is released in your brain, studies have shown, which gives you a natural high. It's actually fun to bow. That was nice. <laughs> So physically, neurologically, it gives you a high. So it's a good thing to do. Free happiness without being banned by the drug agencies. Okay, so if you want to bow three times to virtue, peace and compassion and also release some nitrous oxide.